carrying on in the study of Isaiah, remembering from our last lesson about the, the uh, prophecy from the Lord that he was going to divide the kingdom of Israel because King Solomon had rebelliously turned against the Lord after the Lord had raised him up so so graciously made him almost like king of the earth and Israel on the top of everything and the and in and in awe uh, or rather the awe, the world in awe of Israel because of the blessing of God where people came from all over the world to see the wisdom that God had given to Solomon but he warned him to not love strange wives, but Solomon disobeyed that. Solomon had 1,000. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and they were all the strange wives, meaning wives from the heathen countries around the world. The thing that was so bad about it was the Lord warned him that they would turn his heart. And that's exactly what happened. Because Solomon began to remember, you remember to build shrines and places of worship for every one of his wives' strange gods. You can imagine the terrible condition of the land of Israel and Jerusalem when God had so graciously delivered them from the heathen of the land, the Canaanites. And then Solomon comes around and destroys all of that and brings those evil religions and doctrines back in. And so the Lord said he was going to divide the kingdom from Solomon, but he was going to uh, give part of it to his son uh, for David's sake because David, his father, had been faithful to follow the Lord. You remember as we closed that the Lord promised Solomon's servant that Solomon uh, had so much confidence in and the, the Lord chose, his name was Jeroboam. And the Lord said, I'm going to split Israel up into two. And I'm going to give you, Jeroboam, 10 tribes. And we'll call them Israel. And I'm going to, I'm going to see that you're king of Israel. And if you'll follow me, and you follow in my word and, and do my word, then I will include you in this. And you will be blessed as the promise is to Israel, like Abraham's descendants. Jeroboam, uh, when, when Solomon heard of that, then Solomon wanted to kill Jeroboam, and so Jeroboam excuse me, fled to Israel until Solomon's death, and then he returned. In the meantime, Rehoboam, which is Solomon's son, the kingdom went to Rehoboam, and the Lord said, I'll, I'll give Rehoboam the other two tribes by the name of Judah. And that is for David's sake, King David's sake, because a promise was to David that there would always be a, a king from his lineage to sit on the throne. Of course, he had to take that from the men's and eventually, when they all went to Babylon, 
because of their disobedience, but the Lord never re re reneged on his promise or his prophecy because the king of kings, the branch, the stem of Jesse, Jesus Christ the righteous, came from that tribe of Judah. The fulfilling of the prophecy about David always having a man to sit on the throne of David because the throne of David was an eternal kingdom because of the eternal promise, because of the eternal God, because of the eternal word of God. So we're right there as we begin here today. It says in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 19, so Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam, the one God chose over the 10 tribes, was come again from Egypt, when he heard Solomon was dead, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over Israel. Now, from that point on, there was none of the tribe of Israel, of the nation of Israel, I should say. The nation of Israel, the 10 tribes, there was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. Remember, you might remember from the last study that we showed you the chart where the nation of Israel under Jeroboam, there was not a good king all the way through down uh, the history of that nation. But with Judah, Judah had a few good kings. Had bad kings too, but he had a few good kings. And so that's where we are today. We'll begin right there. We've got a lot to accomplish here to bring out the finishing of the foundation here for the book of Isaiah to understand better the condition of the people, the mindset of the people, and we might also understand more about God and his dealings with people as he attempts to bring everybody around to the point of returning to him. Without making them do it, he gives everyone the ability to choose which way they go. And so that's the condition where you and I are even today. We choose which way we're going to go, whether we follow God or not, whether we believe his word or not, whether we esteem him more necessary than our food, that for our physical bodies, or whether we love him with all our heart and mind. So here we are. Here's a chart showing the divided um, two nations. Judah in the bottom on the reddish color. You can see from Jericho, including Jerusalem, all the way down to Kadesh Barnea, and the green part being the 10 tribes called Israel. Edom down here is where Esau's people settled. Moab and Ammon here is a place that the, the descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew, that's where they settled. And these all became enemies of Judah and Israel, of course. So, and we look over here at the next chart just to show the, the deportations. We're going to study this today to see that Israel 
at one time is going to capture Judah and carry them off to Babylon. But the Lord is going to return that. He's going to reverse that, I should say. And this chart here shows the those different deportations. The first nation to, to be judged for their serious rebellion against the Lord is the nation of Israel. And they were captured by the Assyrian people and carried off into the upper northern place up in here, above. And, and the Judean people are carried off into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And before that time, uh, the king of Assyria carried people, foreigners, after he took captive of, of Israel and carried them off, he, he pulled in and populated this green area here with Gentiles, people of other nations. And that's why they are called Samaritans, because there's a mixture there of both Jewish and uh, Gentiles. That's the condition of it was when Christ came and manifested himself on earth to save the world. So these, these are two charts that will help you in your understanding of what was happening in those days. Let's get started. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 said, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Remember, Isaiah covers a span of four kingdoms. Not kingdoms, but uh, dynasties of, of the nation of Judah. Beginning with Uzziah, Uzziah was a good king. He sought the Lord in his early years, and as king, God prospered him. Second Chronicles 26, it is recorded that Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 50 and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and according to all his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah and that had understanding in the visions of God as and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. These are important recordings for us to remember how the Lord for 52 years had the positive influence there of a king that was following the Lord. But after God prospered him, and in his latter years, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed his, the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense under the altar of incense. Remember that that's only the, the only the, the priests could do that as was designated by the Lord and the service of the Lord. It was not assigned to just anyone, including the king. Second Chronicles 26, 17 says, and Azariah the priest went in after him and with him four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men. So there's 80 people that follows Azariah in to to confront king, the king. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, it appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord. 
but to the priests and the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. You may, you, we must understand also that to burn incense there was, the only one that could do that was the one that was designated as consecrated to the Lord. The one that was purified, that had washed himself in the laver before he even came into the holy place. And the altar of incense was right just before you would, the high priest would enter into the holiest of holies, the only one that could go in there. And so this was gross disobedience that Uzziah did. And verse 19 said, then Uzziah was wroth. He was unhappy with them for confronting him. And he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. A definite sign that you don't mess with changing God's word. The way he designates for us to live and perform, even in the service of worshiping him. You don't change that procedure. Azariah was lifted up in pride and he did that. And as, excuse me, Uzziah, and Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looking upon him and behold, he was leprous in his forehead and they thrust him out, of, out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house being a leper for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now, the rest of the acts is Uzziah, first and last, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, wrote a right, if you want to follow that on through. Then we go on to Uzziah's son, Jotham. So Uzziah slept with his fathers and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belongeth to the kings for they said he is a leper and Jotham his son reigned in his stead. Jotham was 20 and five years old when he began to reign and he re reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jerusha and the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah did. Howbeit he entered not into the temple of the Lord, and the people did yet corruptly. So there wasn't any effort really to clean up the corruption of the people, even though himself personally he followed the Lord. But because he did not seek God, let's look. In those days, the Lord began to send against Judah Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah. You see, the Lord is bringing judgment or chastisement or correction to wake us up to understand that it's, it's death to disobey God. It's total destruction. It doesn't work. So, in the days of Ahaz, who sought after the gods of Syria, in 2 Chronicles 28, 22 through 25,
get this going here. In the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? This is that King Ahaz. For he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them that they may help me. What a mindset he had. He thought that he, the people of the heathen were being blessed because they were following false gods. So he says, I'm going to do that. So I can be blessed by those false gods. But look what it says. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God, cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. How despicable, and how disgraceful for a king of Judah to do that. In the first verse of that chapter, it says Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, but he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David, his father, meaning his ancestor. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Remember this, he's a king of Judah. And this is the split kingdom. The kings of Israel were not following the Lord, none of them. None of them followed the Lord. And some of Judah were following the Lord, but Ahaz was not. He walked like the kings of Israel and made molten images unto Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abomination of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Again, just bringing back into Israel all the evil devices and religions of the world. He sacrificed also and burnt incense in high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Verse 5 says, Wherefore the Lord is God, delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. And they smote him and carried away a great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus in Syria. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. King Ahaz and the people of Judah for Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day. That's a pretty severe spanking. Because of the rebellion against the word of the living God, a refusal to acknowledge that he is God, God of all the earth, and that he has chosen the people that follow him to be blessed of all people and to be a light unto the rest of the world. For the Lord desires all people, Gentiles and Jews alike, to come to know him and to walk with him. This is the story of God from the very beginning. These were valiant men that they killed because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. And Zikri, a mighty man of Ephraim, slew Messiah, the king's son, and Azricam, the, gen the governor of the house, and Elkanah that was next to the king. So Israel has captured Judah and carries them away to Samaria. I, later, I earlier told you Babylon. That was that was, I made a mistake there in in the naming of where they were carried. Israel captured Judah and brought them to Samaria. 
and the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them, and brought his spoil to Samaria. But God sent his prophet with his word. Look at the, the intervention and blessing of God on those people that are supposed to be his followers. We go down to verse 19, but the prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand, and you have slain them in a rage that reaches up to heaven. He says, God was unhappy with Judah, but and, and he delivered them into your hands, but you've killed them, you've slain them in that rage, and all heaven sees it. Verse 10, and now you purpose to keep under the children of Judah. That means to keep the children of Judah under, under their control, and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. You, you want them to be servants of you now. But are there not with you? This is what the, the prophet is saying. Are there not with you, even with you, sins against the Lord your God? He's saying, haven't you done the same things that they did? Who are you to do that to them, to judge them? I gave them into your hand for a, a judgment process to humble them and to awaken them, but look what you've done. Verse 11, now hear me therefore, this is the Lord speaking through this prophet Oded. Now hear me therefore and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. Here's another really significant point of the grace of God who is giving the people there of Israel, the king of Israel, a warning. And tells them, you better take those people back because I'm unhappy with you, big time. Verse 12, then certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Ephraim is a, a nickname, you might say, of Israel, because it was the largest tribe. And so many times Israel is referred to as Ephraim. So certain heads of the children of Ephraim Azariah, the son of Johanan, Berechiah, the son of Meshillamoth, and Jehizkiah, the son of Shalom, and Amasa, the son of Hadlai, stood up against them that came from the war and said unto them, ye shall not bring in the captives hither. Said, you're not gonna bring them in here. For whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass. For our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So these people get the message and say, no, you're not bringing them in here. Not at all, because we're under judgment. You're going to add to our judgment. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. Now we see that they're returned back to Judah. And the men which were expressed, that's the ones we just named, 
by name rose up and took the captives with the spoil, clothed all that were naked among them, arrayed them, shod them, gave them to eat and to drink, and anointed them and carried all the feeble of them upon asses and brought them to Jericho, the city of the palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. So you see, the ones that said, no, you're not going to bring them in here, carried them back to Judah. They're in the land of, Jer of Jericho. Verse 17, for again, the Edomites had come and smitten Judah. Remember, Edomites are those from Esau, the descendants of Esau. And they carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country and of the south of Judah and had taken Beth Shemesh, Agilon, Gedaroth, and Shoko with the villages thereof and Timnah with the villages thereof and Gimzo also with the village thereof and they dwelt there. And here is the reason. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Judah, excuse me, Israel, because of Ahaz, the king of Israel, for he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. But now we're going to see the blessing of God on a king that will follow the Lord. In the days of Hezekiah. And you can run that down in chapters 36 and 39. And in 1 Kings 16, 20. Ahaz slept with his fathers. Was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. So in Judah now, Hezekiah did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, removing the high places, the high places where they were worshiping any old way, doing their own thing unto other gods, uh, burning their children in the fire, et cetera, and et cetera. He removes those places. Second Kings 18, now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, began king of Judah to reign there. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abbey, and the daughter, she, she was the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. He did some pretty notable things. He even removed the serpent that Moses made. Remember that? For the healing of the people in Numbers 22 because they worshiped it. There is this thing that, that Moses made up as an instrument to, for, the, the, for God to move through as was led by him, by the Lord. But the people began to worship it rather than the Lord. And so he destroyed it. He removed the high places break the images, cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, 
nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him. What a message. But kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. So we're going to read a very different story here, or an account, rather, of Hezekiah. Praise the Lord. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. Now, we're going to see the king of Assyria is going to cause him trouble. The king of Assyria was at Jerusalem, and they began to threaten the people and Hezekiah, as it was throughout all the countries around about. In verse 19, he says, And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria. You see, he's going to assert himself here. He's going to lift up himself as the mighty one. As you can see the devil talking through him as we go through this. Listen. What confidence is this wherein thou trust us? He's making fun of the people of Judah now. Thou sayest, but they are but vain words, making fun of them. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? He's saying, you're saying that you're following the Lord. But he's saying, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Who do you think you are to rebel against me? Verse 21. Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust in him. So now he's making fun of Egypt. And he's telling Judah, you can trust in an ally like Egypt and I can subdue them both. And now the warning of the king of Syria. Here's Satan, Satan talking straight up. Not to trust in the Lord. The warning do not trust in the Lord your God. Verse 22, but if ye say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore I pray thee, Give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses, if thou art able on thy part to set riders upon them. He's been very sarcastic to Hezekiah. He continues, How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my servants, master's servants, and put thy trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen. Am I now come up without the Lord against the place to destroy it? He said, do you think I'm coming out here without the Lord? Now look at this. The Lord said, look at that, all capitals. The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. That's what the king of Syria is saying. So let's look at what Hezekiah, how Hezekiah handles this. 
And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and the land. Hezekiah in his prayer is saying, this king has been fierce and he has destroyed other nations. And that's why he's being so cocky here. Verse 18. And have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, Hezekiah is praying here, save thou us out of his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. What a powerful prayer. The reason for the prayer and the deliverance, Hezekiah's desires was that everyone would know that it was God that did it that God would be glorified in that deliverance move. So God sends an answer by Isaiah, the prophet. Second Kings 19, 20. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, that which thou hast prayed to me, against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him, the king of Assyria. The virgin daughter of Zion hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. He's talking about all of Judah is wagging their head at this king, this evil king that's trying to take over Judah. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Question mark. Against whom hast thou exalted thy voice? Who are you really speaking to here? and lifted up thine eyes on high. The answer, even against the Holy One of Israel. He's saying, you're not coming against us, you're coming against the Holy One of Israel. You're coming against the Almighty God. Verse 23, by thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord. And I said, with the multitude of my chariots, I will come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedars thereof and the choice fir trees thereof. And I will enter into the lodgings of his borders and into the forest of his comrade. Here is threat. He had threatened to destroy all the land of Lebanon, and Carmel. He said, I have digged and drunk strange waters. He's quoting again, Seneca. And with the sole of my feet, I have dried up all the rivers of besieged places. He's, his uh, 
he's speaking here uh, uh, about his defeat of the nations around. He's, he's also using metaphorical terms here, but he's talking about how he has done these things, and the Lord is reminding him of what he said. Verse 25. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it? This is the Lord speaking now. And of ancient times that I have formed it? Don't you know, Sennacherib, that I'm the one that's moving this thing. This is my operation. This is my move on Judah. And simply because I'm using you in that move doesn't exalt you. And you don't need to get so proud and speaking out and, and making fun of them and threatening them. I have formed this thing. Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste fenced cities in the ruinous heaps. This was the plan of God for the judgment. Therefore, the reason here, their inhabitants were of small power. He's talking about how he's had, he's used Kenakarim to chastise or judge these other nations. And that's how come, that's why he was successful. It's because of God had allowed him to do that, had called him to do that. Therefore, their inhabitants was, were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as grass of the field and as a green herb, as a grass on housetops, and as corn blasted before it grows up. But I know thy abode, and I know thy going out and thy coming in and thy rage against me. The Lord saying, I see all of this and your rage is actually against me. Verse 28 says, because thy rage is against me and thy tumult has come up under my ears, therefore I will put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way which thou camest. And this shall be a sign unto thee. You shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves, and in the second year that which springeth of the same, and in the third year sow ye and reap, and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. And, verse 30, the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. He's telling Sennacherim that Judah will begin to prosper again under the tender care of the Lord. And that Sennacherim is going to be drawn by the hook in his nose by the Lord and he will not come into Jerusalem. Verse 31 For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant. This is speaking of the, of the, of the kingdom time. And they that escape out of Mount Zion the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. See, this, this is speaking of way in the future, like double reference. I'm going to deliver these people, Sennacherib. I'm using you to correct them, and you're getting out of hand. You're getting proud and lifting up yourself. But I'm going to bring you back. You're not going to come in here. And they are going to come back. The remnant are going to come back. And they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord shall do this. 
12. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. That's the message that Hezekiah got from the Lord. Two, four, two and four, the king of Assyria, king sent a care of. Now verse 33 says, by the way that he came, sent a care of, by the same shall he return. He's going to go back the same way he came. And shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Why? Because that's where the lineage of the Son of God, Jesus Christ the righteous, comes from. Because David was faithful to follow the Lord after his correction and his chastisement. Verse 35, and it came to pass that night, notice this, that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and hundred fourscore and five thousand, hundred and eighty-five thousand people. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. The Lord sent an angel to destroy the Assyrian army. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt in Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Mishrach, his god, that Adramelech and Sherezer, his son, smote him with the sword, and they escaped, escaped into the land of Armenia, and Ezrahaddon, his son, reigned in his stead. What? Now, the people of Judah seen this. They witnessed this. They saw the judgment of the hand of God. Praise the Lord. I'm going to have to hurry here. This is really a, a breaking point right here. Because now we're going to show the Lord's courtroom. He wants all heaven and earth to see this. That he is king of all the earth. Heaven above and earth beneath. And all that in him is. And how he started this thing. He built a people from Abraham. And why? This is why. Verse 17 of chapter 18, Genesis the Lord shall, said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Shall I hide what I'm going to do from Abraham? Verse 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed of him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his whole household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. What a message there. See, the, the Lord has built this people from this people of this nation of Israel before its division. He took these people of Abraham and made a nation out of them. And he says in verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give earth. Hear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have re rebelled against me. me. This is the message that is given to Isaiah from the very beginning. As he's showing Isaiah the people that he's going to call them to, 
They're rebellious people. He's going to show them how the Lord has blessed them because of Abraham and because of the fact that Abraham did his part by teaching them the ways of the Lord, which is what he's telling each one of us today that call upon the name of the Lord, that we are to teach our children the ways of the Lord. It's not good enough to leave it unto some pastor or some school or some other entity to teach our children the ways of the Lord. It's up to us. It's a commandment of the Lord to everyone that names the name of Christ. Abraham is surely blessed. And all of those that follow the Lord, according to the teachings of the Lord, are blessed. But the majority of the people will be rebellious and they'll turn against. But the Lord is building the nation of Israel out of Abraham. I've just read to you verse two where he said, and they've rebelled against me. Now God compares that nation to a dumb ox in verse three and a donkey. That these animals are more intelligent than these people are. Verse three says, the ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. I, I submit to you that that is the condition of most churches in this day and age that we live in. They have no concept of the living God or how he operates and that he's continually working in the lives and the affairs of people and of kingdoms and that his judgment and his righteousness and his loving kindness is going forth moment by moment every day of the year from beginning to end, working in the lives of individuals to bring them into the place of following him and his truth. But most people are like that dumb ox or that donkey. They don't even consider So these, these animals don't, don't not only consider, they don't, they don't even know the owner. They don't, they don't even know how they're, they're being fed. They don't consider. But they are the people of God, the ones he called. The master's crib is a feed. What is the crib? It's the word of the living God. What is the feed for my people? Matthew 4, 4. What does it say? Jesus Christ is answering that question and said, it is written, speaking to the devil, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's the message. That's the word of the master's crib. Does anybody consider that today? Are they really interested in knowing what God said? Are they really interested enough to make sure that the Bible they have in their house, if they have one, is actually the word of God when there are so many different Bibles in the English language that say different things? Obviously, they all can't be right. Is the church so blinded that they can't see that? 
How can it be called the word of God? Simply because they've been lulled to sleep with cream puff messages of self-assurance simply because they've called on the name of the Lord that they will enter into heaven one day. That's only true if they take the rest of that book and put it in context with that statement and then follow it. Why is it so hard for people to understand that? Simply because they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. Simply because God requires a holy walk. Simply because we are to live our life from now on after receiving Christ unto him that died for us and rose again rather than to ourselves. We are to be living instruments and living sacrifices in the hand of a living God to a dying world and the church is far from that in this day and age. The fourth verse of Isaiah, what chapter one, says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel into anger. They are gone away backward. When you start to sympathize with those people back there, don't you judge them in any way adversely. But when you stand, start to look, uh, look at them like they're victims, you'd better change your, your notion. You better change your mindset. It's only by the grace of God that we aren't treated as a church today like those Assyrians were treated by the angel of the Lord for our gross rebellion against the Lord and refusal to consider him and his word. But we go our own way, our own pet doctrines, rather than the powerful, life-changing, unadulterated, eternal, and preserved word of God. Verse five says, why should you be stricken anymore? You'll revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even under the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. That's what the Lord sees about it and says about it. They have not been closed. The wounds haven't been dressed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Here's the characteristics of the sinful nation. They're laden with iniquity. They're the seed of evildoers. They're bringing up kids the same way. Children that are corruptors. Their whole heart, head is sick and the heart is faint. Their accomplishment is simply this. They've forsaken the Lord. That's what they've accomplished. That's what the world has done. They've forsaken the one. They don't know the master's crib or the feed that's in it. They provoke the Holy One of Israel to anger. They've gone away backward and they'll revolt more and more. The Lord says, why should you be stricken anymore? Why don't you wake up? This same Lord said about 600 years later in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So by that, we know the passage that says, this passage that says heavy laden, we know what that means. 
laden with iniquity, under the burden of iniquity, corruption, evildoers. Let me hurry. The land is overthrown by strangers. Look what the Lord says about that. See if there isn't a parallel of the United States of America today. And the church, by the way. Don't get me wrong. I'm speaking to you truth. Truth by observation, not by judgment. I'm leading you to the word of the living God. I'm showing you the result of your carnal judgments and your carnal ways. Church, listen to the word of God. The Lord says in verse 7, chapter 1, Isaiah, your country's desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers devour it in your presence. How true that is today. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Evildoers. The dregs of the world from around the world. Insane asylums, prisons. Dumped into our land and brought in by our government. There needs to be a change in the church because the church has no voice today, speaks not one word against it to strengthen those who would stand against this thing. To lead in the war against corruption and evil, like the mighty warriors in the prophets of old that spoke the truth. The small remnant is out of place here anymore. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in the vineyard, and a lodge in the garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. Verse 9 says, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Amen. I pray and I hope that this message brings that to your full remembrance and understanding. It's only by the breadth and the grace of Almighty God that we stand here today and even allowed to call on the name of the Lord our God. He wants us to get rid of our religion, to hear the word of God and give ear to the law of our God. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. He's saying, even to Sodom and Gomorrah, wake up and hear the word. 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? All your religious ceremonies, saith the Lord. I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incenses, and abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. The note here says, God will not accept empty religion. He will not hear. There's so many empty religious people today. They have a form 
but not a real living, giving, loving experience. They stand for nothing. They speak against nothing. They speak for the world. They act like the world. They dress like the world. They talk like the world. They are the world. Verse 15. And when he spread forth, when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. But he goes on. He wants us to clean up, to put away the evil. Verse 16 says, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes and cease to do evil. I'm not having an altar call today. I'm not asking people to come forward to the altar. I'm asking people to take the responsibility to take off the old man and put on the new. That's what the Lord is saying. Learn to do well. Learn to follow the word. Seek judgment instead of compromising. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the followers. Fatherless, excuse me. Plead for the widow. The Lord is willing if the emphasis here, he wants to do this if. Speaking of this statement now in verse 18 to 20. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient. Somehow the church has dismissed that word obedient. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. You'll eat from the master's crib. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, the sword of the mouth of the Lord, the word of God. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The same word will devour those who refuse. Well, this is a summation right here of this message. Very powerful message. I, I believe you you should see that with me. It is to me, very definitely, and such a need in the, today, and the need for you and I to get out there and speak these very same things that people will hear the truth rather than the lies that are perpetrated throughout the land, that the word of God is lost that it was destroyed thousands of years ago, millennial ago, because of the original copies. Yet the Lord says he preserves his word. Who do you believe? Is it too hard for you to believe that the devil has gotten into the religious instruction of the church? Is it too hard for us to, to fathom that, to understand that? Are we so blinded that we think that everything that comes from the Bible store is correct? Or that everybody that names the name of God is from God? God help us to capture the message here. This chapter 28, you'll notice that the Lord points this out. I wish I had time to go through it. I want you to. I want you to because this will show you that the Lord requires obedience. 
if you want the blessing of God. But if you don't follow, there's a curse. Notice here that there's 14 verses for the blessing. And my, 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 over 30 verses describing the curse. Here is the prophecy in Deuteronomy 28 of the Babylonian captivity, which is a shadow and a type of the tribulation period that will soon be upon us. This is the word, this is the word from the master's crib speaking to us today. And lastly, the scattering of 70 AD when the children of Israel were scattered throughout all the earth. When the Roman King Nero or Emperor Nero had Jerusalem and the temple destroyed and the people of Israel scattered throughout the whole earth at that time and have not returned to that land until 1948. The promise of God is on on the uh, is is beginning to be fulfilled, but it is not the full biblical description of that fulfillment, because today Jerusalem is still trodden down by strangers, like it's described in this lesson today. But the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. And the time of judgment is soon to be upon us, but he's asking for you to come and to reason together and to understand that regardless of, of the path that we've taken and destroyed our lives and our country and our churches, if we're willing and obedient to come to God and follow him, we will eat the fruit of that blessing. We will eat from the master's crib and we'll drink from the everlasting living waters. Because that's the prophecy of the Lord. That is the word of the Lord and the zeal of the Lord will accomplish. I urge you to get serious about your relationship with the Lord in this day and hour. Come to grips with your faith. Understand that the message today is to return to the Lord, to follow his word, to learn him, to become acquainted with him, to understand him, and to walk in his blessed, flowerful, joyful, beyond expression, beautiful word, awesome word. I can testify to you that the Lord has been so gracious to me just as undeserving as anyone. But I'm so grateful to know the Lord. God bless you for being with us today. Take this to heart. Even help me by spreading this message around. I'll have it on the website at lighthouse-ranch dot com by tomorrow and you can use it study it and pass it on god bless you in the mighty name of jesus christ our lord and savior amen